Old and On Air is sponsored in part by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be at home in the community. Additional support for Able and On Air is sponsored in part by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together. Welcome to this edition of Able and On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Siler. Arlene is off today. Thank you to our sponsors. With us to, um, on this informative edition is the North Central Vermont Recovery Center. Um, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? All right, so I'm Stephanie Capizzi and I'm the Executive Director of North Central Vermont Recovery Center. Okay. And I'm Daniel Franklin, the Assistant Director. Okay, what are the missions and goals of the um, North Central Vermont Recovery Center? Well, in the big picture, the Recovery Center uh, is the mission is to help support and serve uh, individuals and loved ones who um, are interested in recovery from addictions. And we do that in many ways. Um, how, how do you guys handle that? Some of the ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we are open every. We're open every day, 365 days a year, and it's a safe place. A person can come in and. Um, uh, talk with people, either volunteers or recovery coaches. They can come in and use our computers, read, and just be in a safe space. And there's social activities and different things going on there. We also have uh, a lot of different meetings and programs. Um, maybe Daniel could speak to some of those. Yeah, so we host a, a variety of both 12-step and non-12-step groups. So, um, What is the 12-step program for those that don't know? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple different models. There's things that are based on the big book, so um, focused on a higher power and the texts, um, also uh, texts written um, by the founders of AA, for example, Bill Wilson and, and other, other uh, academics. Um, but um, we have a variety of groups from Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, um, would you and be, Families would Anonymous. You be, um, can you explain? Okay, so you have Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, okay. How does that, how do those groups work together with your group? So technically, they're independent of the center that we, we host them, um, but they're based on a peer peer run model, um, with, often with facilitators and uh, and readers and so forth. But maybe you can talk Explain about the, the peer run. Steps. Explain the, what a peer run model is. So it's really designed around a person who has time in recovery, uh, a, a progressive model of leadership. Um, so often it's someone with time under their belt in recovery, helping others who are newer in recovery or, or new to recovery uh, to find their way uh, through, through the steps. Okay, and mm -hmm. you wanna to add to that? In, and in just these 12 step groups, they rent the space from the recovery center, work within their own, um, their own program and right there also, so as an entire organization, we are peer run, but um, 12 step meetings work together as a peer. They are individuals who are in recovery, working with other people in recovery, following these 12 steps that help people find Speaking their way. Speaking about being in recovery, um, mm -hmm. does your program, I know we're jumping around a little bit, mm -hmm. does your program um, have staff that are in recovery and um, why is that so important to have staff in recovery when you're counseling people in recovery? We think it's very it's very important and crucial um, and powerful at recovery centers that a person walking in the door, either first time looking for help with addictions or not their first time, but um, are coming in and talking to people that already have lived experience in the same situation or the same issues they're having, and that it's a very it's a very different dynamic than going to a professional. Um, counselor, which I think all are very vital and okay. important. Uh, great. Um, the opiate crisis is huge in Vermont. Okay. Um, how is your organization um, combat, 
combating or working to combat the opiate, uh, the opiate crisis and pills and pill, pill taking, etc. Mm. Would you like to speak to that? Sure, yeah. Um, really everything that we do is, uh, is designed to be a part of addressing the opiate epidemic. The, the problem is that the opiate epidemic has captured the public imagination and the media and the funding because it, of the immediacy and the deadliness of opioids, things like heroin and fentanyl. Um, which is most often what people overdose on what or is prescription. Fentanyl? Fe fentanyl is an illicit drug that's usually used uh, in for 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 end of life care for cancer patients. It was, but now over ninety percent of fentanyl uh, comes from China or Mexico. It's an it's a, become an illicit drug rather than one just used in medical facilities. Um, but it's also cut, cut with all other adulterants. It's about 50 to 100 times more deadly than heroin itself. And then there's another analog called carfentanil, which is many more times that. And, and also, um, I know this is an old drug, but a lot of pharmacies stopped um, people from going to the pharmacy and asking for uh, OxyContin, you know, as, as uh, uh, you know, if you're taking that, they're also using that as a, a, a you know, like popping candy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, since you said the opiate crisis, how is your, um, are you educating people more on those particular things, like certain drugs that have really harmful effects? How, how are you really widening or, or nipping uh, as I say, nipping it in the butt, you yeah. know, uh, in the butt to... So yeah. So we have, uh, we actually have an employee who's our, called a Pathways Guide, um, and she works specifically with the hubs and spokes that do uh, medication-assisted ass treatment or work with people with opioid use disorders. So we have a whole person devoted uh, purely to helping people with, with opioid use disorders. Um, but in general, we do a lot of education with um, materials throughout the center. We have recovery coaching for people uh, with opioid use disorders um, and just uh, we have Narcotics Anonymous um, so we have a lot of things that are built specifically uh, to address that. Um, the culture has shifted a lot around opioids you know with the laws that went into effect in, on July 1st of 2017 it uh, resulted in significant uh, reduction in the prescribing of opioids within medical facilities mm -hmm. um, but it's you know for for many people op prescription opioids like oxycontin um, oxycodone morphine and so forth are uh, a way in which they're introduced to the opioids which affect the brain in a very different way from other drugs and, and alcohol and uh, have tremendous addictive capacity. Um, and so a lot of, uh, Vermont to start with really didn't have a lot of pill mills per se like other states What is the did. pill mill? Uh, you mentioned that. There are places where uh, doctors were prone to uh, prescribe uh, really exorbitant amounts of prescription opioids for minor things like toothaches and you know uh, other injuries, uh, minor, minor injuries that really didn't necessitate that level of pain relief. Mm -hmm. um, so there are states where the pharmaceutical companies like Purdue Pharma that uh, created OxyContin went in and incentivized them to prescribe more of these opioids. So often we hear the story of someone who would start out on prescription opioids and then um, either when their supply was cut off or sometime within their use of those prescription opioids moved over into heroin and other illicit drugs um, in order to to deal with their their pain physical or emotional mm -hmm. um, because also when you mix alcohol with pills it becomes a double, mm. double whammy, a double whammy, or even a triple whammy sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, clean needle programs, another big problem. Well, it, it, you know, needles and heroin 
Do you believe in the clean needle program in Vermont that's happening now? Why or why not? We're, uh, we're, we believe in it, um, okay. both as individuals and we've chosen to support it as an organization. We were the first recovery center to uh, partner with Vermont Cares to provide a harm reduction, uh, a mobile syringe exchange program, the harm reduction van that was funded by the Elton John Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so we, once a month, they come and provide syringe exchange services and a whole bunch of other ser harm reduction services. For like, example? Um, like uh, wound care kits um, and uh, condoms and lots of other self-care products. Uh, uh, Fentanyl testing fentanyl strips. Fentanyl testing strips, which uh, is going to become increasingly important in, uh, in, in this state. Um, we believe in it. Be so there's really two sides of the, of the syringe exchange program. So there's, there's organized, there's, uh, there's Vermont Cares, which has the mobile vans and then some stationary sites around the state, um, but really started grassroots working with individuals using uh, injected drugs around the state and other drugs around the state. Um, and then there's uh, the Safe Recovery Program in, in Burlington. So there's really two kind of sides to this. There's one that people are concerned that the having these services available uh, can sort of enable drug use or promote drug use. The other side is addressing the cost. People are talk about, hey, yeah, you know, if uh, you're how is it becoming a cost? Sure. So so they'll say like, you know, you give you give somebody who's uh, injecting heroin a needle, and they're just going to keep going. Well. That's really a misnomer in the sense that th these things are going to go on either way. But using an unclean needle can lead to numerous hepatitis, hepatitis C, C and endocarditis are the two big ones. So I want you to think about this like uh, to be able to supply needles uh, to someone, clean needles reduces these infectious diseases and, and including HIV, which we've we're down to about 15 new cases of HIV in the state of Vermont per year, which is pretty incredible. Um, but I know there, there, I know that there are drugs to try to yeah combat HIV, but you know how does that work into that? Right. So actually, it, the drugs for HIV, the really expensive cocktail, goes along with a, hepatitis C and endocarditis. So those two, those two illnesses are often come from using unclean needles. You and, say cocktail, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, right now, like, it's a pretty uh, significant regimen to be able to, to, to treat HIV AIDS. So there's a number of drugs that are involved in, in treating that. They're much more effective than they've ever been, but have been disproportionately available to people who either had Medicaid or had a lot of money. Now our care system for that is much better than it's ever been, certainly than it was in the 1980s when we really had the last uh, injection heroin epidemic. Mm -hmm. But with hepatitis C and uh, endocarditis, uh, there were each run of those drugs to treat those diseases can come with a price tag of about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So when you look at the possibility of saving someone's life and of uh, providing a clean needle for two dollars versus one hundred fifty thousand dollars for a course of medication to treat those diseases, to me that's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, uh, what is VT Cares? In, yeah. Since you you mentioned. Um, yeah, Vermont Somebody Cares is a, it's an organization that uh, works with, uh, that provides a lot of services. They have an office in uh, St. Johnsbury and one in Burlington, their headquarters in Burlington, and they have this mobile van that was funded by the uh, Elton John Foundation. And so they, uh, again, so several individuals, uh, we're traveling around the state to places like Rutland and going into the hard communities to, uh, out of their own vehicles, to meet with people with substance use disorders and to provide these types of peer-to-peer um, -peer or one-to-one -one care um, to help try to save their lives when they knew you know, there was a real trust issue. People who were going in, in the throes of addiction didn't want to work with medical professionals or legal professionals. They were afraid of 
of, uh, of the consequences. So they were pathbreaking in helping to reach uh, uh, vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you want to add anything to that? About Vermont Cares? Yes. Um, I think Daniel covered it, and we, it's, it's a, an organization that we um, support okay. and supports us. Yeah. Great. Um, do you have any specific programs within your organization that deals with birth defects and drugs? And um, are, are babies born addicted? Uh, like, is there a myth behind that? Or? We yeah. were just talking about that. Yeah, yeah there, there is. So, um, and I think it, in general this comes to the idea that there is a difference between dependence and addiction. Okay. Um, so babies cannot be born addicted. They are not doomed to a life of addiction. But if, it's, through if, a, the, uh, if a mother takes drugs while pregnant, then what happens there? Yep, so they are able to... They, they are dependent in the sense that they are born with uh, dependent. with dependence, which can be treated right from the moment of their birth to not have it turn into withdrawal. So there is a, a chemical dependence. And so when, they, when they're born, the doctors will immediately act to counteract the withdrawal symptoms, which can be deadly. Mm -hmm. But they are not going, you know, they are not capable of engaging in drug-seeking behavior to address those problems themselves. What are, okay, so um, since you say that, what are some withdrawal symptoms, or for those that don't know what, what withdrawal is? For example, it was a movie, um, based on Ray Charles's life mm. Mm. Uh, with uh, Jamie Foxx. And Ray Charles went into withdrawal, you know, the sweats, the, 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 the high temperature, low temperature, the pacing, the certain itching. things, itching, yeah. that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what are some withdrawal symptoms based on what I've said? You described them pretty well. Yeah. And yeah. flu-like symptoms, um, and the things you you said, feverish and there's itching and um, dry mouth. Just I think uh, feeling terribly like you probably have the worst flu ever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and that's what we learn, and that's what actually you you see a lot of the a lot of the reasons that people addict are, who are addicted continue to search and need to take more and more of their the or need the substance. Fix. Yes. Right, is yeah. about not getting dope sick. They they get to a point where. Um, Really, it's about not having that thing happen to them more than anything else um, to get through their day, you know. And if they are working or they're, um, they might be parents, uh, you know, taking care of children at home. They're, this this um, illness does not does not uh, discriminate on who you know what people. In terms of the media, mm -hmm. let's go into that. Um, how has the media portrayed? Uh, drug addiction, uh, going way back in the um, 80s uh, to now. How has um, the media um, portrayed drug addiction? Do you think it's a good portrayal, a bad portrayal, or is it, you know, according to script? Um, I think there's two ways the media has really fed, fed us on what people... Uh, see or think of as addiction uh, or people who are they you know using terms like addict and alcoholic and junkie and um, we had another one we were just talking about but they label they create an image when people think of those labels and it has a lot to do with um, oh people who are uh, in poverty and, and that it's always linked to crime and it's always linked to um, behaviors that, uh, which is true in a lot of ways, but there are so, that's just the tiniest proportion of the people that this, it, it's not what people think of when they think of the words. Since you said that. And then the other though, the media portrays um, is about what we were talking about earlier in, in so many shows and movies and uh, commercials. commercials and yep. stories, you know, the normalization of always having the drink in their hand and the um, or this buds for you. No, yes. I mean not to um, 
deal with just Budweiser, but like, you know, a frosty mm. beer or exactly. uh, a beer and a pretzel together <laughs> at the ballpark. Um, not only that, you know, yes, you have commercials, but alcohol is just way expensive. Um, for, one, for one beer, for example, at the ballpark with lots of ice, it's talk about seven bucks. Mm. That's not cloud in, in, including the food. Mm. So, you know, and restaurants, they don't just make money on their food. They make more money on their alcohol. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Mm. I mean, Vermont, for example, um, the alcohol tax and the lodging tax is 9, 10%. So, you know, um, talk, I mean, can you talk, I mean, do you, is alcohol, I mean, it's an expensive habit as far as drugs and alcohol is concerned. Sure. Can you explain about that? And, I mean, it, it's uh, the any any addiction and and things like Smoking, that. Smoking, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, yeah. if you think of the individual, the, the the cost to the individual, you know, we alcohol is ubiquitous in our culture. You watch the Super Bowl, and it's ten times more beer commercials than than anything else. It is all around us. It's acceptable, um, and alcohol is still our society's number one addiction. Um, we, it, it is saturated into our whole lives. Um, at, at our center and most of the centers in the state, we see a majority alcohol use disorder, um, in our case about 75%. So as much as the opioid epidemic is taking all of the attention and gets the funding, it's alcohol that is a major force. Um, and I mean, in terms of cost to our society, it cost mm -hmm. last year about Six hundred billion dollars, whereas opioids cost one hundred ninety-one billion dollars. So we're talking about a vast difference in terms of the cost that alcohol has to our society versus any other. I mean, any in, other in drug. The, just a, a comment here: the Bible mentions alcohol. In, so you know, uh, I'm Jewish, and it mentions certain celebratory situations yes. where wine. You know the four cups of Elijah. And then you have Jesus turning water into wine, but that was a completely different thing mm -hmm. uh, uh, to illustrate a point. But you know, um, do you think alcohol? Uh, do you think people um, I mean, to get their fix? Do you think it it, it goes way out of a proportion sometimes? Uh, has um, like when people hit rock bottom, is is there? How um, how do you know when you to for your organization to step in in terms of when people hit rock bottom? Is there a certain point where you just step and say, "Hey, we need to help you"? Uh, how does that work within your organization? Well, at our organization, people come to us because they have decided or determined, or the law has decided that. They're, the law. What do you mean? Perhaps they're in they're in um, legal trouble. Either you know, getting uh, driving under the influence uh, mm -hmm. violations or or other thing crimes or things that have happened that um, they come to realize are directly linked to their substance use or their alcohol use. Um, so that might be one reason. Or a family member, grandparent, child, mother, father um, comes in to talk about their family member that um, is being and their family being negatively affected by the use of drugs or alcohol. So people are usually coming to us because they've gotten to some point that they need to talk about it or look for help. Um, so we don't really determine anyone's level of where they're, where they're at and when they might need help. Um, but we have lots of um, different, and actually it would be great to come back a little bit to some of the different um, services and supports that we have at the Recovery Center. Um, which other than uh, it being a safe place to come in, which I talked a little bit about in the beginning, um, there also are, and the 12-step meetings we talked a little bit about, but there are also all other different um, types of meetings, some that are more conversational style. We have a, one called Refuge Recovery, which is twice a week, and it's a Buddhist-based addiction recovery program. That you said it, Buddhist? Mm-hmm. 
that includes meditation and um, reading and um, and converse and discussion. So um, we also have a number of health and wellness programs which we've launched this past year, which include um, let me see here, Reiki, Acu Detox, Yoga, Tapping. I'm not sure if I can think of some more. So those happen all throughout the month, and they are also um, <coughs> avenues that people find really useful in their recovery um, for numerous Alternative to... All those things. Yes, alternative, um, because we believe in dressing, addressing the whole person, so we cre continue to create um, more and more holistic avenues for people to... Because mm -hmm. I don't believe in any way that there's one way for anyone to, to come into and sustain recovery because um, it is about your whole person and how um, you ended up there. Uh, so briefly, let's talk about uh, what are some of the misconceptions around um, alcohol and drug addiction that um, besides, <coughs> besides the media, mm -hmm. what are some misconceptions? Any interest in speaking on that? You know, we, there is a lot of stigma around addiction that simply doesn't exist around certain other issues. Um, and there's, you know, for a long time, uh, addiction has been affiliated with choice and a lack of self-control, with crime, with um, with hopelessness, with the, with this sort of hijacking of the person that that person's never going to amount to anything or. Um, or move beyond that. You know, there's the, the word junkie, which has come to describe mostly drug <coughs> users as opposed to alcohol, you know, uh, people who have uh, alcohol use disorder, um, talk, speaks to the sense of worthlessness, uh, mm -hmm. of discarding and marginalization and isolation. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of stigma that result, that, that really uh, is, is based around a lot of myths. The reality is people in recovery um, have, there are far more people in recovery than there are in the throes of addiction. That they, even though we, we believe in the United States that there are about 23 million people with substance use disorders in the, in the state of Vermont, Right now, 8,000 people are in treatment for uh, opioid use disorder. Um, we believe that there are about 20 to 30,000 people with substance use disorders in general. But all around us are people in recovery who are living their lives and doing amazing things. And there is a culture not only of redemption, but of paying it forward. And that is this, these peer-based models that uh, the recovery center are at the core of what recovery centers are, mm -hmm. are all built around helping each other, of <coughs> lending a hand, of pulling people from the depths of the worst moments of their lives. Hitting rock to be bottom. Hitting rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And some people's rock bottom is different than others. For mm -hmm. some people, rock bottom is is getting a DUI. Some people, it's, uh, it's losing everything, their friends, their family, their homes, their cars, their everything. You know, everyone's rock bottom looks different. It's, it's the moment that someone realizes irretrievably that something has to change that they have to prog that they have to learn from their experiences and move forward enter recovery rebuild their lives and do amazing things and help others and so every day we're we're inspired by the people that we get to work with who are showing what recovery is and what what's um, possible mm. let's talk briefly about some of the history of your organization mm -hmm. um so our organization back in, well, 2010, or maybe even the end of 2009, a group of professionals um, came together that uh, decided or, or uh, came to the understanding that, that there should be something in the Moyo County that um, helped and served and supported people um, with addictions trying to enter recovery. And um, so the state of Vermont came to agree with that and helped fund the beginning of um, what we now has, have in the Moyle County as North Central Vermont Recovery Center. We have 12 recovery centers in Vermont right now. You guys, uh, are you guys working with C CVH, the, the hospital? We work really with Copley Hospital. That's in our community. Other recovery centers work with the other big hospitals. Like I said, there are 12 of them in Vermont, which is pretty incredible. And, and um, they're connected with the hospital in their area. So we are really connected with Copley Hospital um, and 
and this recovery center, like the others, I'm sure, started out with a, maybe one staff member and a handful of volunteers. And in the years since 2000 and fall of 2010 is when we opened. And um, since then, we have grown to having four staff members, maybe 15 recovery coaches, which we didn't talk about yet. And um, what's a recovery 20 coach since we get, since? Recovery coaches are are trained people, they're also peers, uh, trained to work individually with individuals and family members. We have recovery coaches for family members. So they work individually with them, helping the person um, see what would they like their life to look like, what are the barriers mm -hmm. in the way, and how can they work together um, on the different goals for their recovery. Yeah. And, uh, um, <clears throat> now, uh, what are your uh, we only have a little bit of time left. Uh, what are some f uh, some of your future goals of your organization? Yeah, we want to talk about those. Sure. You know, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, we believe in whole people, and recovery is about a person's whole life. You know, whether they've been in are or have been or will be incarcerated, um, whether they're coming out of um, you know another situation, uh, treatment for example, that's a episodic moment in their lives. Recovery is about the entire rest of their lives and their whole, their whole family, you know, it's a, addiction is a family thing. And so our goal is to provide, is to be able to work uh, with people in a lot of different facets of their lives. So we've focused a lot on groups and recovery coaching and social activities and so forth. Our goal is also to work on uh, people's health. So we're adding health and wellness programs, um, including hopefully an exercise program. Um, there's a, a group, uh, the Phoenix has uh, been occurring here in Berlin and is expanding to um, Hyde Park in, uh, in March, which is providing uh, a group exercise activity for people to live a sober and healthy lifestyle, mm -hmm. looking at nutrition, looking at fi financial wellness. So really helping people rebuild and build their lives across the board in all facets of their life. Well, um, I'd like to thank you for thank joining you. me on this edition <laughs> of Able Gun on Air. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Um, for more information, uh, for more information on the no, on North Central, uh, on the um, North Central Vermont, North Central Central Vermont Center. Recovery Center, where can they reach you? Um, well, where can people reach you? You could reach us by calling our phone number, which is 802-851-8120. Uh, can you repeat oh. that again, please? <laughs> it's 802-851-8120. But we really love to, um, really love to uh, lead people to our website, which is www.ncvrc.com. Can you repeat it one more time? Yeah, it's www.ncvrc.com, which is the acronym for North Central Vermont Recovery Center. Okay. And on there, you will find so many things about what we're doing, what we're about. Uh, you can see schedules of daily things going on, um, um, Gosh, all the different programs and other resources. You can see uh, information about our staff and our board, and it's really a great site. Okay. We're located on 275 Brooklyn Street in Morrisville. Brooklyn Street in Vermont. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, again, thank you for joining me on this edition of Able Dinner and Air. Well, this puts an end to this edition of Able Dinner and Air. I'm Lauren Siler. Arlene's off today. Thank you to our sponsors. See you next time for another informative edition of Able Dinner and Air. See you next time. Able Dinner on Air is sponsored in part by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be at home in the community. Additional support for Able Dinner on Air is sponsored in part by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together.